The French Empire under Napoleon had taken Europe by storm. By the start of 1812, most of Western and Central Europe was under his control, either directly or indirectly through protectorates and alliances. No country dared to move against them except for the British. So in order for Napoleon to pressure the UK to sue for peace, he had to cut them off from trade with the rest of Europe. That meant forcing the Russians to stop trading with the British. And the best, most efficient way Napoleon knew how was through war. He had the largest and greatest fighting force Europe has ever seen at his disposal. So he marches them east, using the justification of liberating Poland from the threat of Russia. The initial Russian defense stood no chance against the 422,000 that crossed the Neman River. So the defenders engaged in a tactic known as the scorched earth policy. As they retreated, towns and crops were burned, making it impossible for the French army to live off the land, and the ever so stretching supply lines could not support an army this large. Constant harassment for the Cossacks made foraging for food difficult or sometimes even impossible. Under this heavy attrition, Napoleon rushes the army towards the city of Smolensk, and by this time only 175,000 soldiers remained. This was the first major engagement, and the heavy artillery fire from both sides destroys much of the city, making it unusable for a supply base for the French. But worst of all, the bulk of the Russian army slips away once again, forcing Napoleon to abandon his plans to quarter in the city. It will be 7th of September, the next time the French finally catches up with the Russian army, which has taken position on the hillsides near a town called Borodino, some 70 miles west of Moscow. About 130,000 men were left in Napoleon's Grand Army, against Russia's 120,000. The defenders have dug themselves into the hillsides, creating defensive positions along two roads that led to Moscow. Russian General Kutuzov fears that Napoleon will take the new road around his defenses, so he places the more powerful 1st Army under Barclay on the Russian right. Bagradian will command the 2nd Army on the Russian left. The battle begins with the French battery firing against the Russian center. Davu sends his forces against the southern positions, known as the Bagradian Fleshes, at one point even personally leading a regiment himself, gaining control of the Fleshes. Bagradian quickly leads a counterattack, only to be charged by Ney who retakes it. Bagradian asks Barclay for aid, which is granted fairly quickly. The French and Russian units clashed. The battlefield was filled with smoke from the artillery and musket fire. Heaps of corpses filled the ground, soon to make this the single deadliest day in all of the Napoleonic Wars. Murat advances his cavalry around the fleshes, hoping to flank the Russian position, but is blocked by Duca's cavalry division. So the French are forced to attack Bagradian fleshes directly, carrying out seven assaults, each time being driven back. Duca leads a counter cavalry attack, forcing Murat's cavalry to hide behind infantry cover. Barclay's reinforcement advances forward at the opportunity, only to be torn to pieces by the French artillery. Bagradian personally leads counterattacks in an attempt to push the French completely back, and gets wounded by shrapnel. Now wounded, he has to evacuate the battlefield. The morale and command structure of the second army collapses, making them very vulnerable. But Napoleon hesitates and refuses to send in his imperial guard after them. In the north, Prince Eugene advances his troops against Borodino and captures the village. His forces then cross the bridge and begin their assault at Ravsky's redoubt. With the help of artillery, his regiments route the defenders. Kutuzov then orders the artillery batteries against the open end of redoubt, paired with a bayonet charge, to regain the position under Russian control. But this was at a cost. Russian columns were still under heavy artillery fire by Eugene, while Ney set up a crossfire with artillery position towards the Ravsky redoubt, pummeling the Russian lines. In the south, Poniatowski is tasked with attacking the southern end of the Russian position, near the village of Utitsa. His Polish contingent captures the village but is quickly ejected by a Russian counteroffensive by Tukov. He again assaults the village and captures it, but the retreating regiment sets the village ablaze. After hours of resistance, the Russian army finds themselves in dire straits. The Russian lines begin their retreat. The French soldiers are now too exhausted to follow them, so the generals on the field request that Napoleon commit his unused Imperial Guard to bring the Russian army to a decisive defeat. But Napoleon rejects the use of his final reserve yet again. He didn't want to risk his guard so far from France. The French army captures the main defensive positions, but the Russian army still offered resistance. Due to the exhausted state of the French army, Napoleon orders his troops to remain instead of attacking. By the next day, Kutuzov orders the full retreat of the Russian army, opening the road clear for Moscow. Although this battle was a victory for the French, it was a Pyrrhic victory at best. 
Upon entering Moscow, the Grand Army finds the city largely abandoned, stripped of its supplies. Fires broke out with no administrative means to control it. Despite the efforts of the French army, Moscow burns almost completely. Napoleon hoped to force the Tsar to capitulate with the capture of Moscow, but no answer came. After one month of camping in the ashes of the ruined city, Napoleon begins his long retreat. Winter was setting in. The lack of grass kills off the horses, and the rest are slaughtered for food. Cannons, wagons, and heavy equipment were abandoned in mass. Disease spread through the ranks, and desertion soared, all the while under constant harassment by the still intact Russian army, which unlike the French could gain more manpower. By the end of the journey, the Grand Army was nothing more but a shadow of its former self. A popular legend holds that only 20,000 of the 422,000 that went into Russia made it out alive.